In this video, I'm going to cover the properties of the transition metals. So transition metals have properties that are similar to each other, but different than the properties of main group metals. So um, remember the main group metals are like the alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals. Um, and so those main group metals uh, are generally fairly soft. So for example, um, this pure sodium metal, you can cut pure sodium metal with a butter knife. It's a very soft metal. Uh, but transition metals are generally moderate to very hard. Uh, titanium is a transition metal. Chromium um, is a transition metal. Those are very hard metals. So uh, the properties of transition metals are generally similar to each other, uh, but quite different than the properties of the main group metals. And what makes the properties of transition metals similar to each other is that they have similar electron configurations. So. Um, remember the transition metals are a big group. Uh, we'll look at the periodic table in just a minute here. But they all generally only have two valence electrons. All of the different transition metals have two electrons. That's why we can put them in the same group as each other um, and say that they're different than the other metals. So here is um, a view of the periodic table that emphasizes the electron structure, the electron configuration of each element. So you'll notice that helium for this table is brought over into the S block. It's not, it doesn't appear over here uh, as a noble gas anymore because as we're filling electrons into, into the atoms, the electron that goes in a helium atom goes into an S orbital. So um, we can see that these pink uh, elements over here are part of the S block. The green ones over here are part of the P block. These kind of yellow ones here are part of the D block, and these are the transition metals here. And the blue ones down here are uh, lanthanides and actinides, and sometimes these are called inner transition metals, the lanthanides and actinides. Um, they have also have properties that are similar to the transition metals. So we put uh, elements in groups, like for example, the alkali metals. These, uh, elect these elements go in a group because they have similar properties to each other. Um, hydrogen, not necessarily included in that group. Uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. These six elements have very similar properties, and it's because they have similar electron configuration. And in specifically, the electron configuration is that they have one electron in an s orbital. 2, s, 1. 3, s, 1. 4, s, 1. 5, s, 1. 6, s, 1. So they all have one electron in an s orbital, which is what makes them similar. Beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium, these are the alkaline earth metals. And they all have two electrons in, s, in an s orbital. So lithium, 1, uh, 2s1, 2s2 for beryllium, 3s1, 3s2 for magnesium, 4s1, 4s2 for calcium, and so on and so on. So these all have two electrons in an s orbital, which makes them similar to each other. So we put them in a family that we call the alkaline earth metals. Now, when we get to the uh, transition elements, they uh, all have have two electrons in their valence orbitals also, which seems strange to say because we saw that the, the valence electrons changed from here to here, but the valence electrons don't change from here to 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 here. All of these elements have the same number of valence electrons. The valence electrons don't start to change until we get to the p block and we start adding p electrons to the atom. And then we those p electrons go in the outermost shell and we call that outermost shell the valence shell so let's think about why that is so here we are in the first row of the transition elements it goes potassium is 4s1 uh, 4s1 that's the the furthest out electron it's the valence electron there's one electron in the valence shell there's one valence electron in potassium calcium has 4s2 so we look at all the orbitals that calcium has. It has a 1s, a 2s, and a 2p, a 3s, and a 3p, and a 4s. Uh, 
So we know that 4s is the valence orbital because the number is the biggest. If there was a 4s and a 4p, then the electrons in the 4s and electrons in the 4p would both be valence electrons. They'd all be valence electrons because they have the highest number 4. But all of the numbers that come before that, 3 and 2 and 1, these are all core electrons. So these electrons are all uh, underneath the valence shell, so they're not valence electrons. So calcium only has two electrons in the outermost shell, the four, um, in an s orbital, and so we say it has two valence electrons. Now, what happens in scandium? Scandium has four s two, three d one. So now we still have these same four s two electrons that we had before um, because these electrons are going to come after we have 4s1, 4s2, and then something that comes after 4s1 and 4s2. So those electrons remain, but the next electron, remember, is 3d1. So the electrons in the fourth row, or the, the d orbitals within a row, always have a number that's one less than the row. So the fourth row has 3d orbitals. The fifth row has 4d orbitals. The sixth row has 5d orbitals. So here we are in the fourth row, so we have 3d orbitals. So that electron, the electron that's supposed to be the furthest one out, it goes into an orbital called 3d1. 3d1 is not part of the valence shell. Remember, all the numbers that are less than 4, they're part of the core. So 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, and now 3d, those are all part of the core. This, this electron that comes after 4s goes underneath 4s. So it's really counterintuitive that it would do that, but when we start filling up the d block, the d shell, it's always underneath the s shell because its number is 3 and the s shell's number is 4. So let's see how that works. Scandium has, only has two valence electrons because 4 is the biggest number and there's two electrons in that orbital. Titanium, 4s2. It has two valence electrons. It, we added another electron, but it was added into the 3d shell. Vanadium added into the 3d shell, right? So it still only has two valence electrons. Now look, something weird's going to happen with chromium here. Now chromium, how many valence electrons does chromium have? It only has one valence electron. Look at this. We uh, we have 4s1, 3d5. So look, it goes 3d3 to 3d5. So remember when we talked about this uh, back in, the in a previous chapter where we talked about electron configurations, we said that um, the reason that chromium does this, let's look at vanadium. Up here in the electron configuration, we have one, two, three unpaired electrons that are um, at a higher energy than 4s. So even though they're underneath 4s, they are still at a higher energy than 4s. Yeah, they, they appear slightly higher than the 4s electrons. And so right here I have three uh, valence electrons. Chromium should just add a fourth one right here. And then what would happen is I'd have one, two, three, four unpaired electrons, and these two down here in 4s would be paired up. But what chromium really does is it takes that one the one additional that was going to be placed there, and it takes one away from 4s and brings it over here. So instead of having a 4s2 and having two electrons there, in chromium one of those electrons moves to the d block because having one, two, three, four, five, spreading all the electrons out like this and giving them all room to spread out is actually a lower energy situation than this, where these electrons are bunched together. So, have, so the electron in chromium kind of spreads out like this because we say a half-filled subshell is particularly stable. Since this subshell, the, the 3D subshell, is half-filled, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it can hold 10, that's a particularly stable configuration, and so chromium doesn't follow the pattern. And so then the next one, because 3d5 is stable, we see it twice, 3d5, 3d5. It likes that pattern, that's a stable pattern. So we go 4s1, and in manganese we just fill the 4s back up. Now it's 4s2 again. And then we continue filling up the d's, 6, 
seven, eight, and then look, the same weird thing happens. I have two unpaired. The next one should go here and I should have one unpaired, but in the next one, I have zero unpaired because one of the electrons from the s orbital again moved over there. So we like 3d5. 3d5 appears twice, right? Both of these elements have a 3d5 subshell because that's a stable configuration. And both of these elements have a 3d10 electron configuration because that's a particularly stable configuration. So half filled fives and completely filled tens are uh, particularly stable. And so we can see that these all have two valence electrons, these all have two valence electrons, these all have two valence electrons, these all have two valence electrons. In fact, even uh, if we look at the um, lanthanides and actinides, they generally have two valence electrons as well, although not entirely because here in cerium we lose that S electron. But we go 6s2, 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 and all of those electrons are going underneath. All of the electrons that we're adding are going underneath. So this huge block of elements right here all has two valence electrons. That's why they all have fairly similar properties. And we call them all transition metals up here and inner transition metals down here. So again, we just looked at electron configuration and the first and second transition series um, is similar, right? We have the first has an argon as the base shell and then we add four S electrons and three D electrons. In the second, we have a krypton base shell, and we add 5s electrons and 4d electrons. Um, the third and fourth transition series, we start adding f electrons, right? So here we have 4s 3d, 5s 4d, but now by the time we get to hafnium, we have a bunch of f electrons, 4f 14, right? So we've got this whole filled shell of f electrons here, and here 5f 14. We have a full shell of F electrons down here in these transition metals as well. So um, the reason, again, that that we fill the three, the four S before the three D, is because the four S is lower in energy than the three D, and the reason that that happens is because of shielding and penetration. Remember that all of the electrons that sit underneath the valence shell are made, they have negative charge because electrons are negatively charged. So when I have a valence shell that's made of electrons and it's sitting on top of a shell of electrons, which is sitting on top of a shell of electrons and so on, as the atom gets bigger and bigger, there's several shells of electrons. All of those shells of electrons are repelling each other. So that shifts the energies of the orbitals and it makes 3D higher in energy than 4S. So therefore, since 4S is lower in energy, uh, we follow the off-bow principle, the building up principle, and 4S is filled before 3D. So even though that's true, we say the difference in energy is not particularly large. 4S and 3D are almost the same energy. That's why we start to see this weird behavior in chromium. We get 3D5 and we get 3d10 and it appears a couple of times because 4s and 3d are similar in energy. So here are some of those uh, um, irregular configurations. So for chromium we would expect that it would be 3d4 but we see that 3d5 is actually particularly stable so it moves one of these s electrons into the d orbital. And that happens with copper too. We would expect it to be 3d9, but we know that 3d10 is particularly stable. So it promotes an electron from s, 4s2. It promotes that, now it's 4s1, into the d orbital. So d5 is, is stable, d10 is stable, 4d5 is stable, and also 4d7 is stable. So this one doesn't quite fit the pattern of half filled shell, full shell, half shell, full shell. 4d7, we find experimentally 
that for whatever reason, 4D7 is more stable than 4D6. So this is what we would expect, and this is what we find experimentally. So when we think about the size of atoms, we remember that they get uh, bigger as we go down a row, and they also get smaller as we go from left to right. So remember, in the second row, lithium is the biggest atom, and then beryllium is smaller, and boron is smaller, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, and fluorine is the smallest atom in that row. And when we get to neon, neon has a full shell of electrons, um, and so its uh, radius is a bit bigger. Um, but we see that this general pattern, they get bigger as they go from the top to the bottom, they get bigger, or they get smaller as they go from left to right. But here are the transition elements. Look at the transition elements. Um, they are very similar in size uh, to each other. So the, these, um, a lot of the elements here, they are growing, but they're growing very slowly, and um, they're not a whole lot smaller than the elements below them, and those are not a whole lot smaller than the elements below them. And so whereas uh, there is a general trend for elements to get bigger as we go down a row, these elements stay fairly consistently sized um, in the transition series. So we can see that here that the third row and second row, they have a very similar radius. Um, in fact, the second row, or the third row, some of the elements in the third row have a smaller atomic radius than elements that are in the second row. So uh, this is because as those elements get um, in the third row, the reason that they're smaller than they seem like they should be is because as we add electrons in the F block in the lanthanide across the lanthanide series, um, those electrons don't do a lot to repel the electrons above them. So remember the F block electrons are going into a shell that's two shells underneath the valence shell at this point. So those electrons don't actually add a lot of extra repulsion to the atom. And so we would expect that because we're adding electrons that the electrons on the outside are going to be repelled more and more and that's why the atom gets bigger and bigger as we add more electrons. Um, but across the lanthanide specifically, we're adding protons. Every time I, I go, uh, I look at the next element in the sequence, it always has one extra proton, which is one extra positive charge, and one extra electron, of course. But if those electrons that I'm adding are not doing much to increase the repulsion, but the protons that I'm adding are doing a lot to um, increase the attraction to, to contract the atom by pulling the electrons in, a bigger positive charge in the nucleus pulls the electrons even tighter, uh, then that causes those third and fourth row atoms to be smaller than we would expect because the electrons that we're adding don't do a lot to make the atom bigger and the protons that we're adding do do, do a lot to make the atom smaller. We call this the lanthanide contraction because we're, uh, we're adding electrons that don't increase repulsion and we're adding protons that do increase contraction. So again, 14 of the added 32 electrons go between the second, uh, between the second and third series go into the F orbitals and electrons in F orbitals are not as good at shielding the valence electrons from the pull of the nucleus. So that means that we're adding positive charge that is helping to pull the electrons closer and even though we're adding electrons, they're not doing a lot to repel the other electrons. What about the ionization energy of the transition elements? Um, remember that the uh, ionization energy is the amount of energy required to take an electron away from a neutral atom. So we start with a neutral atom and we take a pair of really small tweezers grab an electron and pull it away from the atom. And how much energy does that take? So uh, generally when we look at a periodic table, um, when we look at the, oh, here we go, ionization energy. The ionization energy of elements that are, that only have one valence electron are generally low.
and the reason is because he, there's one electron in the outer shell, the 2s shell. Lithium has one electron in, in the 2s shell. And if we take that one electron away with our tweezers, what we're left with is two electrons that are in an s shell, which is full. And we know that that's a stable configuration because we call that configuration helium, and that's a noble gas, and it, it doesn't react very much because of its very stable electron shell. So lithium is not very resistant to losing its electron. If it loses its electron, it becomes like very stable helium. Sodium, if it loses its one valence electron, it becomes like very stable neon. Potassium becomes like very stable argon, and so on and so on. So losing one electron is generally not a big deal to these guys. They have a low ionization energy. But if we look up here, um, or even the, the noble gases, for example, taking an electron away from helium is very hard to do because helium has a full shell. Um, taking an electron away from lithium, lithium doesn't have a full shell. If I take an, its electron away, it gives me a full shell. I'm left with a good situation. With helium, I already have a good situation. It's already full. If I take one of its electrons away, I'm left with a bad situation, an unfull shell. So taking electrons away from completed shells, like noble gases, is hard. And taking electrons away from um, valence shells that only have one single electron in them is generally easy. Uh, and where do the transition metals lie? Well, the transition metals have a similar uh, uh, ionization energy to each other. So we can see that as we go down, uh, generally the ionization energy decreases. And that happens to some extent here too, although there are some places where it doesn't happen. So for example, hafnium has a, uh, an ionization energy that's almost the same as titanium. And uh, tantalum has a ionization energy that's even higher than niobium and so on, uh, partly because of the extra electrons that we're adding down here in the lanthanide series and the electrons that we add down here in the actinide series. So um, we see that the first ionization energy of the third transition series is generally higher than the first and second series. So um, that's uh, opposite than we would expect, and it indicates that the valence electrons are held more tightly. And usually what we see is that as atoms get bigger and bigger and bigger, the valence electrons are held less tightly because of all of the shielding from the electrons underneath. So why is it that uh, the electrons in the third row of the transition series seem to be holding on more tightly to their electrons than we would otherwise expect? Well, if the reason that they don't hold on tightly to their electrons is because of increased shielding, and we saw that the extra F electrons that we've added in that series do not really contribute to the shielding, they don't repel the other electrons very much, then again, what we've done is we've added lots of protons to an atom across that lanthanide series, right? We have 57 protons, now 58, now 59, now 60. Of course, if I have 60 protons, I also have 60 electrons in a neutral atom. So 61 protons and electrons, 62, 63. So across this series, I'm adding lots of protons and lots of electrons. And the protons that I'm adding are helping to pull the electrons in tighter in the valence shell. And the electrons that I'm adding across this series are not doing as much as other electrons do to increase repulsion. The F electrons do not increase shielding as much as we would expect. So it's the same reason. The indicating the valence electrons are held more tightly. Why? Well, they're held more tightly because they that positive the increased positive charge in the nucleus more than compensates for the number the also the additional electrons because those additional electrons do not increase shielding. So, and we see that again here in the electronegativity. So remember that electronegativity is how uh, tightly or how uh, strongly an atom can pull an electron toward itself in a chemical bond. So the electronegativity slightly increases between the first and second series, but the third transition series, again that third row, the electronegativity 
is about the same as it is in the second, which is not what we expect in the rest of the periodic table. Um, because as we, again, adding those F electrons doesn't do as much as adding D electrons or P electrons or S electrons. And that's the first time we've ever added F electrons to an atom. So it's the first time that we see this kind of um, contradicting trend. Okay, and finally, we look at the oxidation states of transition metals. And when we look at main group metals, they only have one oxidation state. All of the elements in the first uh, in the in the first um, column of the periodic table all have a plus one oxidation state. All of the elements in the second row all have a plus two oxidation state. Um, there we go. Right, so they all have a plus one. Hydrogen, of course, has a negative one and a plus one. Uh, the uh, alkaline earth metals all have a plus two oxidation state. But when we start to get into the transition metals, we see that although some of them fit, fit the same pattern, it says plus three, a plus four, a plus five, we get to some that have more than that. Uh, plus three, plus six, plus two, plus four, plus seven. Um, we can even get some that go as high as plus eight. Uh, so there is more than one oxidation state for some of the transition elements. So they don't really fit this same pattern where it goes one, two, and then we can skip all of those and goes three, four, five, six, uh, seven valence electrons, eight. Right, so if we go one, two, three, four valence electrons, at this point, um, I'm trying to fill up a shell. I can either gain four more, one, two, three, four, or at carbon I can lose four, right? One, two, three, four. And so up, up to this point, when we're looking at oxidation states, oxidation states are generally positive because I'm losing electrons to, to get to the shell underneath. I'm losing one electron, two electrons, three electrons, four electrons. But from nitrogen, I can start to gain electrons. So I might gain three. If I gain three electrons, I'll have a, a full shell, and that would give me a negative three oxidation state. Oxygen would gain two electrons to get a negative two. Fluorine would gain one electron to get a, a negative one. And so um, you can see here that when we, if we look at the uh, transition elements, Many of them have more than one oxidation state. Um, scandium only has the one. Titanium, although its most stable oxidation state is plus four, like we saw, they kind of are following this pattern. You can see the most stable is plus three in scandium, the most stable is plus four in titanium, plus five in vanadium, plus six in chromium, plus seven in manganese. Uh, so they kind of are fitting this pattern. But they also have many other oxidation states that are available. Titanium has a plus three and a plus two. Vanadium has four oxidation states. Manganese has six different oxidation states. It can be from plus two all the way up to plus seven. So um, knowing what, the, what oxidation state a transition element is in requires looking at the oxidation states of all of the elements around in that compound that you already know what their most likely oxidation state is, like hydrogen and carbon and some of the halogens. Um, excuse me, not carbon, oxygen. Um, so again, we'll be looking at oxidation states of these elements, and um, we're going to have to figure out what oxidation state they're in by looking at all of the elements around them in that compound.